Okay. Uh, let's see. Tayson, why don't you take this one? All right. Rule out label tear in NHL player. Not seeing a whole lot here, except for maybe a little uh, loss of convexity at the femoral head and neck. Yeah, maybe. There. Uh, the superior labrum looks fine here. This is an arthrogram T1 fat suppressed image. If you look at the PD fat suppressed image, uh, this is what you see. Okay, we got a edema in that muscle right there, right? Right. So this is a vastus lateralis origin uh, here, I believe. And. Uh, uh, this is a muscle tear. It just shows how, <clears throat> if you have the wrong pulse sequence, it's uh, you may not see the edema here. Uh, mm -hmm. Seen kind of nicely on the PD fat set. Uh, Elio, Elio uh, uh, what do you think of this case? Okay, so this is um, left hip pain. Left hip. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm trying to figure out what I'm looking at there. I think it maybe in the joint space there, this kind of oval, low signal. Um, that, mm. that there's this thing here, which you don't see really on the other side. Yeah. Um, here are uh, other. <laughs> so this is 1807. And these are all fat suppressed images. And mm -hmm. here we came back on July 3rd, 07. Also fat suppressed images. Hmm. You know, I'm not I'm not quite sure. It looks like bone. Okay. Um that rounded thing, I, I'm not I'm not quite sure. I okay, don't know. Uh, th this is uh this is an old glamellus tear with uh, uh, ossification uh, within the muscle in, the, in this area. And it's called persistent pain uh, because of the trauma having this large, uh, uh, basically, bone uh, replacing the glomerulus muscle. So evidence of an old tear with myositis ossification, myositis ossificans. Okay. Uh, Danny, what do you think of this case? And I know you're, this is your first time on these, so, so don't worry about it. Uh, uh, just uh, what's, your, what's your thought? This patient has right hip pain. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, and look at the asymmetry between the right and left side in these areas right here. Yeah, there's increased signal just inferior to the moral head on the right. Yeah, it's coming right along here. So it's coming down from above anteriorly. Would it be the Comes down where it attaches here. Right. Um, so this, this is the so distal, this is the iliopsoas muscle. This is the tendon which comes down anterior to the head, and we can see it attaches down here on the proximal femur, and this is a, a partial tear of the uh, muscle and tendon of the iliopsoas on the right side. Uh, don't see that this is a not an uncommon, but it's not a very it's also not a common uh, in a sports injury here of the but uh, one that's you need to be able to to recognize. Okay. Um, see, Taysen, what do you think here? All right. Looks like you know, diffuse edema in that iliopsoas distal muscle and tendon. Right. And and this is a one of those muscular tendon junctions where sometimes the muscle will go all the way to the bone, which is what we're seeing here. So this is really more a muscular tear. That can also lead to problems because of the increased thickness of a muscle with respect, uh, rather than a tendon, and you can cause uh, symptoms there. And it probably makes a little bit of increased risk for, for injury when 
uh, when it's a muscular type attachment and, and not a tendinous attachment. Would you put that in that second grade of, of a strain? Yes, I would. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Elior? Okay, we have a 68 year old female, severe pain radiating to the knee. Um, here again, we see edema in the muscles. Um, here, I think it's not just a low grade tear like last time. I think it's there's some tearing and some fluid within the muscle fibers, maybe retraction. Yeah, That's the, maybe there. some retraction of the tendon there as well. That's right. And with a focal fluid collection. And here, if we go in the axial images, there's here we can see the iliopsoas. There's the tendon uh, higher up. If we come down, you can see the fluid collection next to the tendon. And then you can see a lot of fluid in that uh, distal muscle and tendon down to its attachment. Uh, so this is a bit of a higher grade tear, right? Okay, uh, Danny? All right, it looks like we're seeing some increased signal, more proximal on the right. Okay, here, uh, and also some increased signal intensity fluid uh, coming down in this area, which we can see so, over here. So maybe a SOS or a little more proximally? And then here we go in the axial plane. And the nice thing about the axial plane here is we can compare the two sides. <laughs> Normal on the left, abnormal on the right. Again, we're seeing a lot of fluid here. We're not seeing a nice tendon coming down and attaching there. All this fluid there, normal on the left, abnormal on the right. And here we can see fluid, and that's a retracted tendon coming back up here. And this was a tear at the musculotendinous junction of the iliopsoas on that right side. Okay. Uh, Tayson? All right. So looking within the muscle belly of that iliopsoas, there's some trace fluid there. Yeah. And here's the fat suppressed where we can see it. Not as prominent as on their prior ones. And again, here we can see the edema at the musculotendinous junction within the muscle itself, and follow that edema down distally along the course of the tendon. And here, again, we can see the same thing. And this patient, when they move the, the, uh, the uh, hip, uh, they felt a snapping sensation uh, over the hip. And this is a very characteristic appearance where you see the edema right adjacent to uh, the bone interface with the anterior femoral head. So when you rotate it, you can actually get snapping on the femoral head. And uh, it's got a lot of different names, internal snapping, iliopsoas tendon, coxa sultans, iliopsoas tendonitis, dancer's hip, a lot of names. But what happens is the uh, the tendon comes down here, it gets inflamed and kind of rubs across uh, the bony attachments, producing a snapping sensation and pain. Uh, okay. Uh, Elior. Okay, so 16 year old soccer player left hip snapping psoas. Um, here I see um, edema surrounding that psoas tendon on the axial. Um, on the coronal, it looks like the edema climbs into the uh, uh, tendon's junction. Okay. Um, is this a little... Okay, so snapping, okay. Yeah, so this is another, but you can see edema in this kind of characteristic area right around the tendon, just anterior to the head here, and that's uh, the typical thing that you see uh, with the iliopsoas or snapping uh, psoas syndrome. And often you'll see the edema come up a little bit proximally, but, but not so much into the muscle, just along the course of the tendon. Way back when, we used to uh, call a lot of 
different things or so as a snap uh, when we didn't have MRI. So just about everything that caused snapping in the hip was a psoas problem. Okay. Which of course, we were not always wrong, right? And not, not always wrong. Yeah, right. I guess labral tears could do that, and uh, loose bodies and cartilage disease could also do that. And then here we can again see the typical edema around the tendon, just anterior to the head. Uh, typical of the snapping iliopsoas uh, syndrome. So it, uh, the nice thing about MR, as John is kind of alluding to, is that it often gives us a more anatomic definition of where the symptoms are coming from, which can lead to better diagnosis and hopefully better treatment. Okay. Uh, uh, and again, this just shows the diagrams of where this occurs. But okay, uh, I'm sorry, Elior, were you the last one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, Danny. So I'm seeing the increased signal just anterior to the left uh, moral head. Um, might be at the insertion of the psoas. Yeah, so this is probably the iliopsoas tendon. We're right around the musculotendinous junction, but now we have a lot of fluid here. Notice also that we probably have AVN of the left femoral head, probably a little effusion in the joint space, but let's concentrate on this. Uh, so so what do you think is going on here? Um, it's so bright. Uh... Bursal fluid, okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, the iliosaurus bursa, when it fills with fluid, can actually be quite large. Uh, but uh, bursitis is another finding, and it can, can be associated with a snapping tendon syndrome or not, uh, either way. But you can have fluid here, and that's probably an indication of chronic uh, <clears throat> overuse of the patellar, of the iliosaurus tendon and tendinopathy, which leads to... Uh, to fluid, just one second. I'll get back to that. Uh, okay, and then here's another example of a, a fluid in a in a bursa associated with the tendon. Okay, uh, uh, Tayson. All right. Looks like a lot of heterogeneous signal there. Uh, in the musculature is that like obturator and maybe adductor magnus. Okay. Uh, okay. So this was uh, myositis ossificans. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so th this uh, this is what was called myositis ossificans, where it was referred to a tumor surgeon to evaluate for myositis ossificans. Uh, here's a follow-up scan two weeks later. Okay, so that region of heterogeneous signal definitely has decreased. There is a iliocellus bursal collection there. Yeah, and as a typical bright signal around the periphery, lower signal internally, uh, uh, suggestive of maybe a hematoma. Uh, this was a uh, trauma from uh, skateboarding, and uh, yeah, this is kind of the mechanism of injury here. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so you can see where that might hurt. The smart person is in a truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so they decided to bring the patient back uh, for uh, an MR angiogram. What do you think about this? I do see a focus of uh, contrast extravasation there, still on the uh, yeah, the MIP images. Okay, and a little bit of collection there, and this is what it looked like on the CT exam. 
Yeah, so it looks like it's there's still there's a uh, real sonogram where you can see truncation of the of the vessel there and a little contrast pooling. And this was an occluded femoral artery mm. in that location. And this was a false aneurysm of the circumflex femoral artery. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, Elior, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here looking at the left side. Okay. I see some edema on the uh, on the right image along the greater trochanter. Um, could be bursal fluid. Um, is there a small av avulsion there? Uh, there's a regularity in the bone there, so maybe a bone injury. Yeah, and uh, th this was thought to be kind of a chronic traction injury and tendinopathy of the gluteus minimus and medius tendons with fluid in the bursa. And it's typically called trochanteric bursitis. Though, as you guys know, I, I'm not, I, I personally don't like that term very much <clears throat> because these injuries are almost always due to tears of, uh, of heavily tendinotic tendons. They're quite common in middle-aged and older individuals, especially uh, women. Uh, and they're, they're really partial tears of these tendons after they become atretic. And as we've talked about before, uh, a lot of people kind of uh, look at the anatomy around the hip, and it's kind of similar in some ways to the shoulder, and this is called uh, rotator cuff tears of the hip. And as we remember from the, from the shoulders, 100% uh, and, and cadaver work, 100% of tendons that were torn in cadavers had underlying chronic tendinopathy, which weakens the tendon. Normal tendons uh, are very difficult to tear. So this is a case of uh, where you really have uh, tendinotic changes which weaken the gluteus medius and minimus tendons, and they tend to partially tear and then can have complete tears, uh, which leads to... Uh, uh, irritation in this particular area, a lot of granulation tissue, and the clinical term of trochanteric bursitis. And the, the important thing to realize, I've said this over and over again, this is not primarily an inflammatory condition. <clears throat> this is a traumatic injury to the tendons, and uh, it should be treated as a traumatic injury, uh, not as a primary inflammatory condition. Okay. Uh, Could it possibly be both? Uh, I guess if it got infected, you could have an inflammatory condition there, uh, <clears throat> but that's that's really quite rare. Uh, it's almost always due to uh, uh, tears of the tendon. You can get a lot of granulation tissue there, but that's separate from an inflammatory condition. It's not really a complement mediated inflammatory reaction and uh, and and you need to to treat the torn tendons uh, I, I a, well, she was in her 30s many many years ago and uh, I uh, in injected her with cortisone and tried to aspirate fluid and one time I got some fluid out before I uh, injected cortisone and xylocaine yeah but uh, uh, she was fine for a couple of weeks and came back, and she said, still bother me. So after about three or four different tries, I decided to go ahead. And, and you could actually feel the uh, the prominence in that area and, that, and squishy yeah. feeling. So I operated on her, and, uh, and everything was just perfect. Nothing, nothing was there at all um, and uh, I sold her back up and uh, and she never come back e either I cured her or she just got mad at me I don't know she yeah. was kind of sweet <laughs> yeah. on me so it's okay I, I, I think she would have come back yeah I think so too but it was one of those things I, I just couldn't figure out what the hell it was wow yeah 
Okay, and here's just another example here. We can see a hip replacement on the right and trochanteric brussel fluid on the left. Again, uh, uh, clinically called trochanteric bursitis. And then okay. the sagittal image is showing the fluid in the trochanteric bursa. Well, the, ten the tensor fascia, a lot of, of rubs on that area too. And that, right. So that, that, that can also be an irritating factor. So. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, a plastics on those. Yeah. Danny, what do you think of this one? Uh, looks like displaced fractures of the bilateral inferior pubic rami. Okay. And there's the ultrasound. And I, uh, complex fluid collections. Not sure where we're looking. Yeah, right. Okay, here's the end. <laughs> that baby doesn't look normal. Yeah. Here's the end. And then, uh, that's supposed, that supposed to be a joke. <laughs> so mixed signal intensity collection in the uh, region of the posterior proximal thigh. Okay. Uh, similar. Yeah. So so this patient had the fractures, but then had a morel lava lay lesion, which we've we've talked about a number of times before. This is really a traumatic separation of uh, the subcutaneous fat at the basement membrane, and uh, you get hemorrhage here. And it's, uh, uh, as John has talked about, this is a difficult lesion often to treat. It's hard to get that membrane to, to reattach uh, uh, the, the, the base of the subcutaneous fat to the, to the basement membrane. Uh, but John has talked about different surgical treatments to, to do this, which over time can be successful. There are grading systems for this, uh, but most of the people I know don't actually use uh, grading systems. Uh, but uh, uh, if you deal with people who use a grading system for this, then, then, then you can do that. But uh, the primary thing is just to recognize these hematomas, which separate the deep subcutaneous fat from the basement uh, membrane and make sure that uh, you recognize that they're morel lava lay lesions. Okay, uh, Tayson. All right, right hip pain and mass after trauma. Looks like we have a large heterogeneous collection on the lateral thigh. Okay. Yeah, I'd be concerned this is a more all out of lay lesion as well. Yeah. And it looks like this is more subacute with a lot of different stages. So this would be a yeah, a later stage more all out of lay lesion. And as you can see, these can become very large. And the larger they are, the more difficult they are to, to treat and get those tissues to re-adhere to one another. John, do you want to say anything else about this? Well, what you have to do is make two incisions above and below. And uh, then you take a bottle washer kind of a device and you, you scrub out that all the stuff that's in there. Usually you find a bunch of uh, fibrous tissue and of course fluid uh, that's uh, different colors. And you, you rub out as much of the tissue that, that, that you find, um, try to get rid of all of it uh, so that and of course the fluid also and uh, then what you do is you put uh, uh, active drainage in, 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 into the um, um, vacuum area and vacuum it out and uh, then put a pressure dressing on it and change it a couple of times during the hospitalization but these are not easy. They, they, this can get infected and it can be a real, real problem. So the sooner you treat these, uh, and, and if you can try to prevent them, that's the best way to do it. Uh, and, and as soon as you see them, drain them and then put pressure on them. But once you get to the, some acute phase or a, a chronic phase, you're, you've got problems. Thanks, John. It's not, not, not easy to treat. It's, it's not just a little bruise. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and this would be, this is an old moral level lesion that's kind of left over from the, the scar tissue. Yeah. And if you see a lot of uh, uh, peripheral enhancement like this on, on contrast, and if you have a clinical situation where you're worried about, worried about infection, uh, this is what you hope doesn't happen in the treatment. But you, uh, this uh, one indication where uh, contrast may be helpful is if you're concerned about an infected Marley lavalier lesion. And this just kind of schematically shows this is down where you've got these vessels that, that go from the from the uh, the up through the deep fascia into the subcutaneous fat, the marl lavalier lesion, uh, you get a a glancing blow uh, which causes a shear force right between the fat and the deep fascia. Uh, this causes a, a loss of contact here or breaking of the of the of the contact fibers. It also tears these bridging vessels, which leads to the hematoma uh, that we see. And that's kind of the pathophysiology. But the thing is, if you only re remove the fluid, you leave uh, the bleeding co uh, continues, and, and so the seroma continues. So you, you'd have to do it over again if you didn't do it the first time. Yep. Thank you. Uh, the more Elior, times you do it, the greater chance of infection. Elior, what do you think of this case? Okay, a 20 year old slipped on ice. Um, yeah, so edema on the right surrounding the um, kind of in the region of the tensor fascia lata and also the gluteus. Maximus, maybe attachment on the femur, but um, I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, maybe a tear of the tensor fascia lata. And here we could see the hemorrhage there in that location. Oh. Yeah, good. And the iliotibial band, the part of the tensor fascia lata. Good. Okay, uh, Danny? So, on the left, more so than the right, you see increased signal, yeah. I believe, the hamstring musculature. Okay. And you can see on the axial images, a little bit on the right, but much more on the left. It's kind of laterally here. This is predominantly the biceps femoris. And uh, this was an acute tear. And uh, we've talked in the past about the different grading systems for muscle tears. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I won't go through that again. I think we'll have another lecture later where we'll discuss uh, the different grading systems for muscle tears and how some are, are, are better than others, but this is basically a tear. It's got a lot of kind of fluid collection on the left, so this is relatively high grade on, on all the grading systems, and uh, this is much lower grade on the right. Okay. Uh, Tayson, this patient has bilateral hip uh, prostheses and has chronic right hip pain. All right, well, looks like there is a fluid collection uh, on the right side. Um, oh. Yeah, I don't know, is this uh, particle disease or something? Looks like it extends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly looks like it's coming from the joint space here. It, uh, we, we don't see a lot of, of uh, susceptibility artifact in it. Okay, so it looks like the... that's, that's a different case. So, so this is more just fluid, but uh, uh, this particular patient, this really wasn't particle disease. Uh, this was a chronically loose uh, uh, hip prosthesis, which led to chronic irritation and a large... Uh, basically, synovial cyst coming from the joint space. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, left hip pain here. Uh, L is this? We lost John, I think. 
uh, Elior? Yes. Um, yeah, so on the left side, I think we, th that's the attachment of the rectus femoris. Okay, so I right think, there. and there's, mm -hmm, this is a detachment of that origin there. Right. So oh, I think we're doing. I think we're going to go through the anatomy here. So there are two heads of the origin of the rectus femoris on the left side. Uh, uh, the direct head attaches directly to the inferior, anterior inferior iliac spine. The indirect head goes around to the side and really attaches to the side of the uh, iliac bone uh, over here. Uh, so here we, we here we can see the direct head is pulled off. I don't really see the indirect head, so my guess is the indirect head is probably torn in this patient as well. But we can see that the uh, straight head or direct head is torn. And this just shows where the straight head or direct head attaches here. The uh, uh, the the other head attaches laterally along the cortex here. And this is just another example in an old scan, poor quality scan of the direct head, rectus femoris muscle, tendon, and a tear of the direct head. Here, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the reflected head is still attached. And here's another example where we can see a partial tear of the direct head with fluid uh, right around that attachment there. Okay, uh, Danny, what do you think of this case? So, 25-year-old soccer player, rule out labral tear. Uh, so some increased signal along. Um, so it's at the, it's at the anterior inferior. Okay. Yeah, that's the an anterior inferior iliac spine. This is so would that the, also be rectus femoris. This is the rectus femoris muscle. There's the rectus femoris tendon, and we can see a lot of high signal intensity on the PD fat sat images involving both. So here we're de we're dealing with strains of both the muscle and the tendon. On the sagittal images, we can see it coming across here involving the tendon as well as the muscle and musculotendinous junction. The axial images, we can see it here uh, anteriorly, and you can follow it up to its attachment to the anterior inferior iliac spine on the axial images. And there we can see the direct head here, and that's there is attachment there. This is the reflected head over here where we can see a lot more edema in this patient, and this is where the reflected head attaches on the lateral aspect of the iliac bone here. I don't think that's operative, so I, that, that will scar in. Good, good. Okay. Uh, Tayson. All right. So I see a uh, curlinear mineral density there adjacent to the uh, acetabulum. Probably an avulsion of the rectus femoris. Does the MR help? Yeah, I think it confirms uh, what we were thinking. Uh, anterior, yeah. anterior, anterior, it's fine. Normal on the right, normal on the right, abnormal on the left, abnormal on the left. So that's where the direct head attaches. And then here we can see the abnormal signal in through here. And again here, and here are the post contrast images here. Okay. Okay, crutches. Okay, uh, uh, Elior. Okay, so looking at the coronal image. I see a complete tear of the direct. Okay. Uh, so it's normal here, normal yeah. attachment, completely torn and retracted here. Now, mm -hmm. 
uh, when it's retracted this amount, it's usually both heads. Okay. If you just have a direct head, if the indirect head is still attached, it tends to still tether the muscular tendinous junction so you don't get as much displacement. So you have to look carefully at the indirect head when you see this much displacement because it's probably torn as well. Okay. Though uh, maybe... Yeah. So and, here we can see a lot of image case. coming out here. Yeah. Normal over here. And I don't know. We'd still have to look carefully at all the images to see about the indirect head here. But we, yeah. So this was a complete tear, both the direct and indirect. Uh, Danny? On the left, we're seeing. Increased signal um, at, I, I think, again, the anterior inferior. Okay, good. Uh, and, but, yeah, so there's a little avulsion fracture there. Yeah, good. So this is a fracture. And this 13-year-old, mm -hmm. as, as we know, uh, young kids rarely will tear tendons and ligaments. They don't really have any degenerative chains. They're usually very strong. And the weak link is really the bone rather than the tendon. So in younger people, teenagers, and uh, uh, children, uh, you really look for the bony avulsion injuries uh, rather than the other. John? Yeah, that's you... an apophysis, isn't it, John? Yes. So how would you treat this one, John? I would leave it alone. Okay. And just let it, uh, let the bone heal. And here we can see the fracture. Left. If the kid is not uh, very cooperative, I'd put him in a, a spike, a cast. Okay. Good. After a spike, a cast, he will never do that again. <laughs> yeah, right, of course. Okay, Tayson, what do you think of this case? It looks like we have probably an avulsion there, anterior, inferior, iliac spine. You can see the abnormal calcification there. Again, normal on the left, abnormal on the right. And this, again, just shows the anatomy of the direct and indirect heads. Uh, this just shows you the, the different heads if you do cross-sectional imaging uh, through the muscle and tendon. Okay, chronic avulsion. And here's what it looks like on the MR examination. Okay, uh, Elior. Okay, 29 left inguinal pain for a week. Aggravation one day ago. Mm. Uh, nothing's jumping out at me on the left. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, so we're looking at the rectus femoris uh, origin again. Uh, it looks, it looks ed edematous at that attachment. There's some bone edema. Uh, not... I'm not sure if there's a fracture though. Yeah. Okay. 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 Now another kind of injury that you can get here is called an intramuscular degloving injury, uh, the femoris, and this really doesn't occur at the attachment to the anterior inferior iliac spine. It's more at the muscular tendinous junction, uh, where uh, the the tendon and muscle can basically pull and kind of uh, displaced from one another, and you can get these tears of the muscle around the tendon attachment, and it's kind of it's called a degloving type injury, but this is a tear really of the muscle, and uh, here are some examples uh, where, where you can see these this kind of edema. The tendon is intact. If we looked at all the images, we could see it going to the bone. What you have is a tear really at the muscular tendinous junction involving primarily the muscle around where, where the tendon attaches to the muscle. So this is really more of a muscle tear. 
and uh, and uh, yeah, let's see what they say here. Yeah, but those kind of degloving injuries of the muscle, uh, it's it's well, John, you can tell us about uh, trying to suture muscle and what tears are yeah, surgery and not yeah. surgical. If it's longitudinal tear, then you you can try to put the two um, torn parts together and suture them together gently, and uh, and the chances are that they'll stick together and and, and you won't have a a, a hole there. Um, but if it's transverse, uh, uh, there's no way to, to to suture that muscle. All you would do is you would de uh, decrease the circulation and, 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 and that will just fall apart. So suturing muscle that transfers is not possible. Uh, now, the general surgeons uh, use uh, uh, what they call that uh, uh, Cushion that they put on that got a mental block in my head. Uh, some kind of mesh. Uh, mesh, yeah. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that might help uh, with the surgery, but I uh, and in these, in these cases you might ask for for uh, surge, uh, general surgeon's help. Okay. Yeah, but we don't, I we don't, you, I've never used much myself. Yeah, I think generally, most of the time, we consider those non-surgical injuries when they're really muscle tear injuries. Yeah, yeah if they're longitudinal, you might give it a go with that. Right. But if it transfers, forget it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Danny, what do you think of this one? 13 year old male, right pelvic pain. Uh, nothing's immediately jumping out. Okay, what do you think of right here compared oh, to two sides? Yeah. yeah, so the increased signal at the, or maybe even fluid collection at the uh, iliac. Uh, okay, the iliac oh. bone. So the question is where on the iliac bone is this? And this one's a little higher up than what we've been looking at. So, but here on the sagittals, we can see here's so the, anterior superior. Well, um, no, I, I actually I, I misled you there. I didn't mean to. Oh. Uh, but again, I think this is the rectus femoris tendon coming here. Oh, okay, okay. Oh no, I'm, I I apologize. I'm the one that got confused here. This is. Okay. A little bit farther down, this is actually the sartorius muscle attaching, and it attaches up at the uh, anterior superior iliac spine. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, this is, yeah, so this is anterior <clears throat> superior iliac spine. Okay. That's the only uh, thing that was there. Taysen, what do you think of this one? All right. Um... Yeah, on the right side, we see a increased signal in the right iliac bone and probably a, an avulsion of that tendon yeah. there. And this is up high. We're in this, uh, the lumbar spine area. Yeah. And this is much more lateral than the anterior inferior. So this is, again, the anterior superior iliac spine area. And we can see the separation here in the bone edema in this patient. And this is an avulsion injury of the anterior superior iliac spine and see all the bone edema. Could that be a contusion also, John? Uh, it, it could be a contusion, but it looks to me like there's really a separation here between the tendon and the bone, which is more likely to be caused by an avulsion. I guess you could have a contusion first that could weaken the bone and then get an avulsion fracture. Yeah, looking at the other side, I think you're... Yeah. I don't yeah, see a lot of right. cutaneous edema, so I think it's most likely an avulsion injury. Treatment-wise, I don't see any treatment that's surgical. Okay. And then here we can see the, the bone edema. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Elior. Yeah, so here we have a CT looking at the right anterior superior iliac spine. It looks like an asymmetric injury there, some separation. Yeah. So CT can often be helpful in these if you have any concern. This is a normal uh, uh, growth plate on the left, and you can hear this is clearly abnormal uh, with the fracture going through the growth plate and avulsion injury on the right. So if you have doubts, it's uh, not a bad idea to get a CT scan uh, sometimes to more clearly define the, the bone injury if you're concerned about bone injuries. Okay, uh, Danny? So again, I think a uh, avulsion of the uh, anterior superior iliac spine. And that's what it looks like on plain films, right? Okay, uh, Tayson? All right, college freshman runner, thigh pain, rule out stress fracture. I do see some periosteal fluid there uh, surrounding the femur. Maybe some medullary edema as well. Mm, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But we certainly we see edema along the, the periosteum of the, the medial uh, femur here. I think... Uh, we, we, I re recently read... A case like this was someone, was it you, Tayson? Or we saw a case like this? Maybe it was someone else. Uh, oh, we saw one today. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, so Tayson, what do you think this might be? Um, I mean, it could be a stress injury, but there's also like a broad attachment of the uh, adductor on that side, right? There you go. Good. So this is really where the adductor attaches. <clears throat> And you can, you can get some bone edema with these, but uh, uh, these are called thigh splints, but these are basically uh, avulsion injuries of the adductor attachment to the medial uh, femur in this location. So, and they're often called thigh splints. They're very painful. They typically occur in sprinters. And uh, John, do you want to talk to us about the treatment for these? Uh, rest. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, Danny. All right, uh, leg pain in a 10 year old female soccer player. Um, so I think you might have um, some periosteal reaction along the proximal femur. Yeah, medial. again, this is a medial proximal femur. You can uh, we can see there's a periosteal reaction. It's a little, a little bit laminated. So you, there are a lot of things to worry about uh, when you see this. You can think about tumor. You can think about infection. can cause a laminated uh, kind of a periosteal reaction. But if it's at an attachment to a major muscle attachment, uh, then uh, which this is, this is where the adductors attach, uh, then you need to put the clinical information together and not have people worry about tumor or infection uh, when the clinical information clearly uh, suggests that you have an, a, a traction injury. And again, this is another case of thigh splints. And here we can see a lot of bone edema in this case, more so than the last case, and edema involving the, uh, the adductor attachments there. And here we even see some abnormal signal intensity within the cortical bone, showing that there's some injury to the cortical bone as well as this for a 10 year old somebody's really pushing this kid right that's right uh okay uh say elior okay 19 year old right thigh pain for a month after ballet um 
Yeah, in the medial aspect of the femoral diaphysis, we see this periosteal reaction. Yeah. You know, it's an attachment of the adductors. Could this be another yeah. Yeah. stress reaction? Right. And here you can see the CT scan shows that the calcification right on the adductor attachments there to the to the femur. Here's the MR scan showing the edema and the hyperostatic bone formation in that location. And again, this is a adductor insertion. Okay, well, why don't we stop here and we'll uh, pick up on other hip uh, ab abnormalities uh, on Thursday. Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. You too.